Hello and welcome to this Poetry Corner. This part of the YouTube channel is dedicated to poetry learning and some people in particular will recognise me. So hello Year 10 and I'm sorry that I can't be with you. Today I'm going to read The Prelude, the extract called Stealing the Boat. As you may know this is a very long poem written by Wordsworth and we're only looking at a, a short extract from it um, for your exam, although it might not seem very short to you. So what I'm going to do is read the poem through once, and then I will give you some suggested annotation for what you might do to your poem. Obviously, if you are watching this as a supplement to your own learning, there may be things that you and your teacher uh, disagree on from what I've said, um, but feel free to uh, ignore or supplement what I am telling you, or sharing with you, I should say. So first of all, some context. You might be wondering why there's a picture of the Lake District behind me. Well, William Wordsworth lived and worked in the Lake District for his life, and the picture you see behind you are the hills behind the th village of Grasmere which was where Wordsworth lived with his sister Dorothy to start with and then with his wife and family as he got older. The village itself is an inspiration to him and it is said that he used to walk around the hills and the lake and that nature really was something he felt passionate about writing on and as part of the romantic movement he created a whole host of poems about the Lake District and about nature. So here goes with one of them. One summer evening led by her I found a little boat tied to a willow tree within a rocky cove, its usual home. Straight I unloosed her chain, and stepping in pushed from the shore. It was an act of stealth and troubled pleasure. Nor without the voice of mountain echoes did my boat move on. Leaving behind her still on either side, small circles glittering idly in the moon. Until they melted all into one track of sparkling light. But now, like one who rose, proud of his skill, to reach a chosen point, with an unswerving line I fixed my view, upon the summit of a craggy ridge, the horizon's utmost boundary. Far above was nothing but the stars and the grey sky. She was an elfin pinnace. Lustily I dipped my oars into the silent lake, and as I rose upon the stroke, my boat went heaving through the water like a swan. When, from behind that craggy steep, till then the horizon's bound, a huge peak, black and huge, as if with voluntary power instinct, upreared its head. I struck and struck again, and growing still in stature, the grim shape towered up between me and the stars, and still, for so it seemed, with purpose of its own, and a measured motion like a living thing, strode after me. With trembling oars I turned, and through the silent water stole my way back to the covert of the willow tree. There, in her mooring place, I left my bark, and through the meadows homeward went, in grave and serious mood. But after I had seen that spectacle, for many days my brain worked with a dim and undetermined sense of unknown modes of being. O'er my thoughts there hung a darkness, call it solitude, or blank desertion. No familiar shapes remained, no pleasant images of trees, or of sea, or sky. No colours of green fields, but huge and mighty forms that do not live like living men, moved slowly through my mind, 
by day and were a trouble to my dreams. Right, so hopefully you've got your copies of the poem to hand and hopefully you can see this. I'm looking at this resource, the AQA Anthology on Power and Conflict, which I know my Year 10 group have got in front of them. As I say, I'm going to suggest some annotations and certainly the group I'm talking to will know who they are. I would like you to annotate in your poems my suggestions, but of course there will be time for you to pause the video, talk about what I'm suggesting and make your own additions. So let's start by looking at the very first line. One summer evening, led by her, I found a little boat tied to a willow tree. Well, that's the first two lines, actually. But who do you think the her is? I'd certainly like you to highlight that and maybe just put a question mark by it. Some suggest that that's nature personified. Others suggest that it is the boat kind of calling to Wordsworth to lead her on. There's a happy rural image of a little boat tied to a willow tree. So maybe you could highlight that in a different colour and on the side write rural image. You should have your guide that says something similar anyway. So the poet is setting the scene, he's telling us what he's doing. He now gives us a little bit more information about this boat. It's within a rocky cove, it's its usual home. So there's a sense of familiarity there. Wordsworth knows that this is normally found there. And maybe you could highlight the words usual home as it's familiar to him. But also on the next line it says, straight I unloosed her chain. So he's confident he's going to do it straight away. And although in the next line it says it's an act of stealth, it's troubled pleasure as well. So by an act of stealth, the narrator knows he's doing something wrong, but there's a sense of guilt about it. So what I'd like you to do now, don't look at the notes you've got, just cover the notes and with your partner or the teacher, just discuss this. What technique is troubled pleasure? I'll give you a moment. So, I hope you all got that it was an oxymoron. Good. Because trouble and pleasure are opposites. They contrast, don't they? So this is the first hint, really, that there's something wrong about this experience from the narrator's point of view. Line six. The troubled pleasure... Nor without voice of mountain echoes did my boat move on. OK, so what technique do we have there? If you can highlight, please, without the voice of mountain echoes, I'll give you a moment to think about that and come back with what the technique is. So if it's a voice of mountain echoes, it's going to be personification yes it's a human quality given to something inhuman such as the mountain so we've got the sense that we've got man and nature together here and maybe it's easier to connect with emotions which is the thing I know you're looking at at the moment by hearing voices connected to the mountain leaving behind her still on either side small circles glittering idly in the moon we've got the idea repeated of the personification through the boat and that there's something beautiful in the wake created on the lake we've got that visual imagery there of the circles and they're glittering in the moon as well so you might want to just highlight that positive imagery, um, visual imagery of the light on the lake. We've got the hint of something a little bit nefarious, look that word up, with the moonlight. It's at night, it's not a time you would imagine someone to take a boat out. So just take a moment to highlight 
and comment on those words please. In that line you've also got some assonance so you've got glittering idly in the moon it's still so you've got that repeat, repeated I sound which just gives the sense of um, the rhythm it's the boat moving gently across the lake then there's a slight change of mood we've had the scene set and the narrator comes back to himself so if you're ever talking about structure this is a change of perspective so with a different colour if you could just highlight but now like one who rose proud of his skill we've got a structural device of change of perspective so this change of perspective gives us a sense that the narrator is confident he's proud of his skill isn't he and that you will find is a contrast to the mood later on in the poem so line 12 proud of his skill to reach a chosen point with an unswerving line unswerving he's got a point in view that he wants to aim at and he's not going to move from that point I fixed my view upon the summit of a craggy ridge so he's setting the scene for us um, if you look again at the image behind me there's craggy ridges all over the place and it's visual imagery that's bringing the poem to life for us now in line 15 and 16 can you get a different color please I'd like you to highlight the horizon's utmost boundary far above was nothing but the stars and the grey sky so if you can imagine the horizon means that's as far as you can see and he can see nothing at this point apart from the sky okay now it's an emptiness there that contrasts later on with when the mountain fills his vision so just bear that in mind when we're going to look at line 22 so lines 15 and 16 just write a note next to it the emptiness contrasts with line 22 and with the same colour please just highlight line 22 and we will come back to it so hopefully uh, you've just paused there to catch up with the annotation I just wanted to mention at this point the idea that the writer is just painting a picture for us you know why is he talking about the horizon um, why is he talking about the stars and the grey sky well it contrasts to later on when uh, it's there is quite a lot that's not empty so it's adding to the mood of something a bit more gentle maybe he's enjoying himself at this point he then talks about his boat so you may need to highlight that the fact that a pinnace is a small boat and I'll give you a moment to discuss uh, what the word elfin means so you should have got something along the lines of an elfin being um, something magical fairy like now what technique has the writer used on elfin pinnace then well done I knew someone would tell me that it was a metaphor and you will see on the notes a suggestion that the metaphor of fairy makes the scene, scene seem more magical and otherworldly so we're now going into that sense of maybe the supernatural the slightly unreal um, very slightly sinister tone and mood to the poem just take a moment to highlight that so the next three lines tell us that all is well he's still confident and he's enjoying himself and he is connected to his boat I dipped my oars into the silent lake sorry lustily I dipped my oars into the silent lake so he's got lots of energy still and as I rose upon the stroke my boat went heaving through the water like a swan so you know what technique that is simile good it shows he's confident in control and the boat is powerful 
A swan is a large, powerful, visually striking bird that is graceful on the water. Then there's a change. And I need you to highlight the word when and next to it the word volta, V-O-L-T-A, which is a turning point in a poem. I'll give you a moment to do that and also think about why the poet has done that at this point. So hopefully you've got something about a change of tone there. Again, it's a structural device used to change perspective, tone, mood, because suddenly something is going to happen, isn't it? And what is that? Well, from behind that craggy steep till then the horizons bound in other words the horizon was keeping everything in all of a sudden a huge peak black and huge you've got some adjectives there that are kind of dark more sinister and there's a repetition of the word huge as if with voluntary power instinct so something animalistic if you like upreared its head so the mountain is personified it's ugly it's got power and it suddenly changed how Wordsworth feels so take a moment to highlight that please so we've got the idea that it is a living thing this mountain and he wants to get away from it it's almost monstrous isn't it with its head rearing up I struck and struck again and growing still in stature so in other words getting bigger or seeming to the grim shape towered up between me and the stars and still still for so it seemed with purpose of its own and measured motion like a living thing strode after me so he feels as if this mountain has got up and he's walking towards him a couple of things that you should note as the repetition of the sibilant s sound struck still stature shape stars so it seemed okay now that is a hard sound repeated so there's a kind of um, sinister mood there so I'll give you a moment to just make a note of the sibilance you do need to look on a word level as well so words like growing okay so the the verb growing suggests it's becoming more and more menacing towards him um, we've got adjectives such as grim okay towered um, and then after that we have got the idea that the mountain is powerful and in control so it's got a purpose of its own with measured motion so what technique have we got please on measured motion so did you get that it was alliteration and the purpose of it is really just to take the readers attention to those words and to emphasize the aspect of the mountain now um, what does he do then well he wants to escape so he struck and struck again he's striking at the water is a violent word a violent verb powerful verb if you like to indicate the speed with which he wants to get away with trembling oars I turned and through the silent water stole my way back to the covert of the willow tree so he's frightened he's trembling but then we're back to this sense of something a bit disallowed a bit secretive he stole his way back and it's in the covert uh, which might sound a bit like covert like an MI5 operation and I wonder if he feels that the mountain is watching him and has caught him out in this crime if you like of stealing the boat now as you go through or after you've just thinking about the content of the poem I just want you to uh, think about the contrast 
so at the beginning there's a lovely elfin positive images of the tree and the pinnace and now we've got the dark um, feeling and sense surrounding the mountain and the fear of the writer which is the next thing I want you to think about the impact of this experience on Wordsworth was long-lasting so let's look at some of those words in the next bit there in her mooring place I left my bark so that's um, a small boat and through the meadows homeward went in grave and serious mood so there's a change of tone there there's the negative fearful words which I know you're looking at in this session but after I had seen that spectacle so he thinks it's something out of the ordinary by using the word spectacle for many days my brain worked with a dim and undetermined sense so for many days uh, he couldn't quite put his finger on what was wrong of unknown modes of being oh my thoughts there hung a darkness call it solitude or blank desertion so you need to highlight the words dim and undetermined darkness solitude this kind of vague language suggests that he's not sure what's unsettled him about his experience but it definitely has and it stayed with him now for a moment thinking about semantic field which is words connected by a similar meaning we have got the word solitude we've got desertion so there is a sense that the narrator is felt alone now he's been left alone by this experience can't really explain it to anyone else because they might think he's a bit mad in fact some students have said to me what miss he thinks the mountains chasing him well it's this sense of the the mind playing tricks with him and showing us what fear can do then he goes on to say no familiar shapes remained nor pleasant images of trees of sea or sky so just take a moment, I'm going to pause again, to look back to the beginning of the poem where we've got a similar idea, okay, an idea of familiarity. So I don't know if you came up with the idea of a cyclical structure, so in a circle if you like. We started the poem with him finding something familiar and now we've gone back to, at the end, in his thoughts he can't find anything familiar okay so that's unsettled him as well so you might want to highlight no familiar shapes no pleasant images there's nothing which Wordsworth would normally take from a walk or a visit to a lake of pleasure it's the opposite that he's left with again we've got that repetition of the imagery of pleasant trees sea or sky no color of green fields at the beginning you've got the willow tree which by the way I didn't mention is one of those big trees that has small leaves but overhangs and kind of hides I'll come back to that at the end and then we've got the reminder that what's left in his head is a huge and mighty form but it's still personified because he says that do not live like living men so some strange inhuman creature moved slowly through the mind by day and were a trouble to my dreams so he's being influenced by nature in some way and he's being disturbed by it so my final thoughts are that in this poem nature and fear are contrasted at the beginning nature is helping him it's hiding the boat the willow tree is kind of like a friend the boat moves through the water smoothly like a little elf and then like a swan and then all of a sudden something changes and his vision makes him frightened 
So there's a lot there. You will need to spend maybe 10 minutes now going over some of the ideas that I suggested. If you've got any questions, please email uh, in whatever way you can or put on the channel. So in particular, Year 10 at that school, you know where you are. Good luck with this, but everybody else as well. Thank you.